This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, podcasting from the regular office of uh, Amethyx Technologies based in Belgium. We made it. We got to the last episode of the series Embedded Machine Learning. Uh, this is part five. If you are not familiar with uh, this series, uh, I highly recommend you to go back to the first episodes on uh, the official website, datasciencetome.com, but also Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, um, or whatever other podcast aggregator out there. <laughs> I never remember. The list keeps growing and growing, in fact. There is also Amazon, actually. But anyway, in this series, I've been discussing about a very important topic on which I have personally put my bet on for the next few years, uh, which is embedded machine learning. And um, starting from the first episodes, I've, uh, you know, opened these boxes, uh, hopefully did a decent job um, explaining uh, what embedded machine learning is and why it is important. So again, feel free to listen to these episodes again or for the first time. Also, don't forget to drop by our Discord channel. Uh, we have an official Discord channel. You will find the link in the show notes of this episode, as always, or on uh, datasensatom.com. What is this last episode about? Well, the, in the last episode, I want to go into more detail about um, machine learning compilers, and in particular, deep learning compilers, uh, which is a very important tool, and uh, there is a lot of theory behind, but also very interesting tools that have been developed by the community or by dedicated teams within organizations. Uh, as I said, it's one of the most important components that allows us to, uh, let's say, bridge the gap between front-end and so high-level uh, programming uh, that is, for example, PyTorch or Python or TensorFlow or all the other frameworks that I'm going to explain in a minute, um, and bridging that gap between, indeed, high-level programming uh, to this intermediate representation, as I mentioned in the last episode, and finally to the target architecture, which is, uh, indeed, the hardware uh, on which you are actually flashing your machine learning model and uh, hopefully run it as fast as you can or as fast as the hardware allows you to run these things. Uh, remember, what we want to do with embedded machine learning is running machine learning models on hardware that is extremely constrained. There is not so much memory, there is not so much compute power, and especially there is a, a, a big constraint in terms of energy, energy consumption. So we want these things to, you know, these tiny devices to last on battery, uh, and of course, we want to, that to happen, you know, as much as we can, as long as we can. Uh, so all your models have to be kind of, you know, reframed under this constraint. And some models, of course, are not even possible, not even feasible to be performed by this hardware. Who is in charge or what is, uh, in fact, in charge of making this, um, let's say, squeezing these models to the last bit, as I said last in the last episode, is indeed the compiler. But before we get there, let me give you a brief overview of what do we mean by, for example, deep learning frameworks. There is no big news here. We are all familiar with these things. We are all familiar with these tools. Um, if you are listening to this podcast in particular, uh, you have definitely been playing with things like TensorFlow, uh, Keras, PyTorch, uh, probably Cafe, some of you. MXNet was another one, uh, is another important framework out there. And then, of course, uh, Onyx is uh, the so-called Open Neural Network Exchange uh, format, which uh, essentially allows you to represent computation graphs built by different deep learning frameworks under one common models that everybody can understand. And Onyx is one, probably one of the most important pieces of the puzzle here, uh, though it's not related to, of course, machine learning, uh, embedded machine learning, but it's, you know, a general tool uh, that is actually very useful for uh, portability uh, of your model. Uh, and so with Onyx, essentially, and I close it here, um, you 
I have the capability of, for example, designing or implementing a model in PyTorch and definitely run it into a TensorFlow runtime or the other way around. And in all, pretty much all possible combinations between uh, frameworks, uh, deep learning frameworks. So it's a very powerful tool, a very powerful mm, protocol, in fact, and also um, model format uh, that allows you to store and load models in uh, the most compatible way possible. Then, of course, there are some, uh, let's say, historical frameworks that uh, are no longer there, unfortunately. Um, well, some of them, I personally use them. For example, I learned uh, on Theano um, that is no longer uh, maintained by developers, unfortunately. It was a great, uh, a great framework, in fact. And then, of course, we have, uh, uh, we have to mention Torch uh, that has been pretty much replaced by PyTorch. <laughs> And um, another one was um, that has been replaced by MXNet uh, is was Chainer uh, for those who remember. Uh, so you know there is uh, there are frameworks that uh, have started and then you know have started this amazing adventure of having uh, deep learning frameworks in the community and then they have kind of you know uh, disappeared and uh, shadowed by uh, whatever the community has chosen. And of course, uh, there is a very interesting list already of uh, very powerful deep learning frameworks. So in this episode, I would like to move indeed from the uh, deep learning frameworks, or, you know, the APIs that you use to uh, implement your model or to uh, represent your idea in code. So for example, building a particular um, deep learning uh, network or deep learning architecture with the specific number of layers, with type of neurons, type of activations, functions, etc., etc., And of course, moving from that, you know, level of representation of your model uh, towards the uh, final machine code. In fact, how the, the microcontrolling unit or MCU sees your model um, on, the, on the ROM, right? or on the CPU, or if you have a GPU, if you have any sort of accelerator, how does that accelerator see the same model? Of course, it will see it according to its own instruction set architecture, or ISA. Let me speak about the hardware now that I mentioned. So what is the hardware? Well, hardware can be, in fact, uh, of different types, different kind. Uh, we can have, of course, general purpose hardware, and this is the classic CPU, uh, but it's also you know, becoming more and more off the shelf, the, the concept of the GPU. Uh, so it's already considered some kind of general purpose now because uh, pretty much any device out there has uh, one or more GPUs, even your, uh, your phone, and it doesn't even need to be the last generation phone. Um, of course, we also have dedicated hardware. And this is, uh, you know, many of you will remember when Google came with the so-called TPU or Tensor Processing Unit. Um, that, uh, of course, includes a, a matrix multiplier unit, a unified buffer, uh, an activation unit. And so essentially, this is a, uh, you know, hardware that has been specifically designed to perform tensor computation. And of course, the primitive uh, of the uh, tensor processing unit is uh, is the matrix uh, rather than the vector or the scalar for the CPU, uh, sorry, for the GPU and the CPU respectively. Another type of hardware is uh, neuromorphic hardware. Uh, this is not so common yet. I think it has very interesting potential uh, because neuromorphic chips kind of replicate the structure of the brain tissue and you know these neurons that you you know synthetic neurons of course uh, can behave as uh, storage units or processing units um, so they can store and process the data and so you can specialize neurons for these two type of operations and essentially provide the typical functionality and the typical let's say workflow that the biological brain would uh, would have or in fact has <laughs> in front of uh, sensory data or in front of world experiences images audio etc etc now what is in between essentially you know between the the code that you write like the pytorch model or the tensorflow model that you write and the uh, cpu or the gpu or the dedicated hardware like an fpga or an asic uh, or whatever 
what's in between? Like, um, what's the process that drives me from a PyTorch model to uh, running it on uh, on a microcontroller? And well, that process, uh, in fact, is a quite long uh, workflow and quite complex. There's a lot of theory involved. As I said, a, lo a lot of theory that comes from the field of um, compilers and interpreters. Uh, nothing new, of course, to computer scientists, but uh, something that, of course, is more and more getting specialized towards deep learning models. But these things have always been around, you know, from the invention of C and the compiled languages, of course, you know, uh, that's uh, that's how high-level programming languaging, languages, in fact, uh, get tr uh, compiled and transformed into uh, low-level instructions and machine code. So if, we, if I wanted to give an overview of the typical design architecture of a deep learning compiler, I would definitely start from the, uh, of course, the input format of deep learning models, as I mentioned, a TensorFlow, a PyTorch, or a CAFE, a MaxNet, Onyx, etc. And going down, I would uh, start representing that um, code into the so-called computation graph. We are all familiar with that. It's uh, essentially a way to represent your code into a graph, and uh, I will give more details later. Um, so on that graph, I can essentially start applying some, you know, the first form of optimization, you know, optimization on the computation graph. And here there is some transformations that is invo are, inv are involved and that come from, uh, uh, you know, operator fusion and uh, several other operations that have been borrowed by uh, linear algebra, in fact. Um, and again, I will give some additional details uh, in the in the remaining of this episode. But let's start from the overview. We got to the computation graph. We can where we can apply already the, some form of optimization there. Um, and here we are representing things uh, with the so-called high-level intermediate representation, or also called graph. IR or graph intermediate representation. Um, this is a representation that is clearly device independent. So there is no knowledge, no information about the hardware that is going to execute this graph. Um, so at this point, all the optimizations that we can perform are at the graph level. As we move, uh, you know, low level, as we move uh, to the metal, towards the metal, we start involving uh, some hardware information. And so uh, here we are adding to the recipe uh, some hardware information so that we can perform some hardware specific optimizations. Um, and here I will mention something related for, for example, intrinsic mapping or memory allocation, um, memory latency hiding, uh, loop oriented optimization, parallelization, and so on and so forth. These are all methodologies that are, you know, optimizations that exist in the realm of hardware uh, and hardware design. At that point, uh, we have the so-called low-level intermediate representation. You know, we are towards the metal now, so we have an intermediate representation that hardware vendors and hardware manufacturers uh, will have to consider when they want to uh, come in the market with a new uh, a new hardware architecture. So, of course, we, we said it last time, We they don't have to know from which framework or from which language that particular computation graph uh, that they, they want to execute or they want to optimize against uh, comes from. In fact, they don't care which uh, deep learning frameworks uh, people are using as long as they have the low-level intermediate representation and they will start designing hardware according to that intermediate representation. In turn, in, in contrast, you know, the, the high-level guys, um, they don't care which architecture, which low-level architecture and low-level intermediate representation their graph will be translated to um, because, you know, the two things are pretty much decoupled. And that's uh, indeed the gap, where, where the gap is, and that's where compilers are to bridge that gap and to make all these, you know, conversions as smooth as possible and as optimized as possible, of course. Finally, in the last stage, you know, after you have also optimized with respect to the hardware, the last thing that you need to do, or in fact, the compiler needs to do is finally to generate code. Um, and so code generation is something that is usually leveraging uh, existing compilers or existing tool chains, in particular LLVM, which is 
a super widely used toolchain. It's probably one of the most advanced piece of software out there um, after GCC or pretty much compared to GCC probably um, that supports and can generate code for uh, a number of architectures, even some quite exotic ones. <laughs> and that's exactly what we are going to leverage uh, even for machine learning, for deep learning models. Um, why using different tools? In fact, when you know, hardware is hardware, code is code, <laughs> instructions are instructions, regardless of what you are designing, if it's a deep learning model with uh, three or 300 layers, who cares, you know, from a CPU's perspective or from a GPU perspective, it's exactly the same thing. So when it comes to uh, representing graph intermediate representation, um, there is only one component or well, a very well known component, which is the DAG or direct acyclic graph. Uh, and that's one of the most common ways to represent indeed a computation graph. This is used by uh, several frameworks out there and uh, also the theory behind, you know, graph theory is the theory behind that representation is very mature for uh, applying a bunch of computations and bunch of uh, operations and optimizations on, at the graph level. So nothing new there. Uh, the theory is supporting us and it's pretty mature. So also the algorithm that have been developed in the years, in probably the last 40 years or more uh, around graph theory are all there, still valid, <laughs> don't need to uh, start from scratch or reinvent the wheel. Things get a bit more, uh, you know, sophisticated when we want to represent, for example, tensor computation. And so uh, the representation of tensor computation, uh, you know, we can choose there, we can, you know, it can be divided into three major categories, uh, like Tensor computations can be represented as uh, functions, so function-based representations that you can have a set of functions in uh, symbolic programming and uh, usually without any side effect um, that actually represents a particular operation or a particular, yeah, a particular tensor operation. We can also have lambda expressions. This is the typical, uh, ex you know, the typical representation of Apache TVM, of which I will uh, speak extensively in the rest of the episode. Uh, a lambda expression is uh, a very used and very common way to represent functions, to represent computations, in fact, because using lambda expression, uh, programmers can essentially define a computation without actually implementing a new function. So we know more or less, you know, if you are familiar with programming languages, you should know what a lambda function does. And then uh, we have uh, Einstein notation and uh, Einstein notation, in Einstein notation, the operators need to be associative and commutative. And uh, this is a restriction, uh, of course, that uh, makes things a bit clunky uh, when you represent them, uh, but uh, makes things much easier uh, when you are optimizing towards parallelization. And so it's a trick that you, you know, by simplifying, by using a uh, less powerful representation or a less expressive representation, you have a better way towards uh, parallelization. Einstein notation is also known as the summation convention um, that is, uh, you know, a notation to express summation. If there is one important uh, thing to mention is uh, about the data representations. In most of the data, uh, in most of the deep learning compilers, data is uh, usually represented via placeholders. And, uh, and this is a very common way to represent variables with an explicit shape. So variables do have a shape, do have size. Uh, and if you have, if you're dealing with high dimensional variables or multi-dimensional variables, you know the shape, you know the size of these dimensions, but there is no values. So it's like, imagine these empty boxes that you have there without any values. Uh, and, and the value will come when you actually execute the operation and you know you will fill this box of the, uh, you know, the result of that particular operation. But for the time being, you're not computing anything, but you're just saying, hey, I have this variable or this bunch of variables, I know their shape, I know they are vectors or tensors or matrices or whatever, but I don't know what their value is because, you know, this is lazy compute. So I, I, I can first describe the computation and then I will, you know, push the button or the virtual button uh, and actually compute the, uh, the, the actual value. 
So this is a very common way of, uh, of representing data. So because it's very important for a, a, a compiler to know what the data layout would look like. And so you need to know the shape of, of variables and, and the memory layout, because if you have to uh, build a, uh, a strategy uh, to allocate memory and you want to do that in the most optimal way, well, you need to know the sizes, of course. And so values are not important for now, but uh, the dimension of these boxes where these values will be uh, is indeed important to optimize. And then, of course, we have other mechanisms usually uh, that deal with the operators or the support uh, operators, you know, the, the most common ones like uh, multiplication, uh, summation, and uh, uh, tensor operators like reshape, resize, uh, broadcast and reduction operators like mean, argmin. We are all very familiar with these things, I suppose. Um, control flow operations. So this is also something that we want to support in a in a compiler. Uh, derivatives, it's when it comes to uh, deep learning and uh, uh, differentiation, is uh, is probably the most important operation out there. And of course, other customized operators uh, that the particular deep learning compiler can uh, or implement or not. All this complexity, as you can understand, it's we are only at the at the high level intermediate representation. So we are just representing the graph. So imagine the level of complexity that that you should expect, because we are only in uh, the first step of the entire workflow. Um, should we go low level? Sure, why not? So low level intermediate representation is a way to represent, um, you know, the so-called target dependent. Uh, representation of your model. And, um, and here is where you can perform so-called target-dependent optimizations, because you provide interfaces to tune the computation and also memory access. And of course, memory access depends on which hardware you are, uh, we are dealing with. Uh, what's the layout of your memory? What's the type of instructions that access memory? How complex that uh, particular instruction is uh, that is pretty hardware-specific. But in order to represent your graph uh, with the low, level, the low level intermediate representation, there are several uh, implementations out there that are very well, uh, well known to the, uh, you know, to compiler and interpreter designers. One is the halide based intermediate representation and the other is the polyhedral based intermediate representation. Well, with halide, essentially you separate computation uh, from schedule. So rather than giving a specific scheme directly, the compiler that adopts halide uh, based intermediate representation tries to various possible schedule and of course chooses the best one. So essentially the boundaries of memory reference um, according to the allied based intermediate representation is restricted to bounded boxes aligned to the axis. So you need a pretty regular pattern in order to exploit the halide based intermediate representation to its full potential. And uh, we are lucky here because computation in deep learning are quite regular to be expressed kind of perfectly with the uh, with allied intermediate representation so no big deal there apache tvm has uh, not only adopted an allied intermediate representation but also improved on that uh, using an independent symbolic uh, ir and then we have the polyhedral based uh, intermediate representation that in contrast to halide uh, the boundaries of memory reference and loop nests can be polyhedrons uh, with uh, pretty much any shape uh, in the polyhedral model now, of course, this uh, allows you to have much more flexibility, uh, of course, in, with memory models. And that's why this is used in generic compilers, because uh, for generic code, you not, not necessarily have very regular computations like you have in deep learning. Uh, so that's why, of course, the complexity is much bigger, it's much higher there. Um, and also the optimization, it can take much longer, but uh, it, you know, the let's say the requirements for general purpose compilation are a bit less strict than uh, than uh, deep learning computations. Deep learning computations are pretty regular and this is not the case for general purpose uh, programming. And uh, what happens uh, next, you know, once we represent, we can represent the uh, low level intermediate representation, as I said in the previous overview, well, it's a time for code generation. And so uh, code, in fact, is generated based 
on the low level intermediate representation. That's why um, hardware vendors don't need to know anything else than the low level intermediate representation. That's enough to proceed building, designing, and, and building, in fact, a new hardware architecture and optimize for that architecture. The only thing that these people need is indeed the low level intermediate representation. And that's beautiful because that's a piece of engineering that has perfectly decoupled the two tasks. So let's speak about optimizations now. So what can a deep learning compiler optimize and where? Since we have a, a front end and a back end, as many other things in computer science, and since we have mentioned we have high level frameworks, deep learning frameworks, and a low level representations towards the target, towards the hardware. Well, this means that the optimizations can happen in both places. Uh, one at uh, a, a series of optimizations at the uh, front end uh, level, also called as front end optimization, and one, of course, in the low level optimization or the back end optimization. So let's see what do we mean by this. Well, the first thing that we can do once we have the uh, graph representation of our deep learning model is the node level optimization. So you know that the DAG or the compute, computation graph at high level is represented by nodes and nodes can be enough complex to enable optimizations inside the single node, right? Um, so here you can have, for example, um, knob elimination or you can have padding within the same computation node. Right. Um, then we can have block level optimization, uh, which usually consists of uh, certain, you know, algebraic simplification optimization. Um, for example, uh, strength reduction, constant folding, uh, where you, for example, can replace more expensive operators by cheaper ones. Um, that of course semantically do exactly the same operation or constant folding where uh, by which you can replace the constant expressions by their values this is what compilers do all the time you know uh, instead of uh, leaving an expression and recalculate it all the time if i've calculated it once and i know that expression is for example constant uh, across my entire program well i can just replace it wherever i find that expression with the value that i pre-calculated or i calculated the first time that's what uh, that's a form of optimization that is applied at the block level. Indeed, it's called block level optimization. We can have uh, optimization of computation order. Um, for example, uh, with matrices, matrices, this happens all the time by applying um, linear algebra um, replacements. Think about uh, making the product or well, the multiplication of matrices that are transposed. So you have like uh, A transpose multiplied B transpose. Now, if you come from linear algebra, you know that the first simplification that you could do is uh, switching the order. So B multiplies A and then transpose the result of that multiplication. So you would save one transposition. <laughs> so, you know, this type of, of optimizations, you know, nothing super fancy, but they can be extremely beneficial to, you, to, the, to the overall computation. Because imagine you have, you know, millions of these operations, sometimes billions of these matrix multiplications, and the matrix is, you know, can be as big as the business application requires, right? So by this very naive replacement, you can save probably hours of compute, of compute time and, and, and watts and watts of batteries uh, across multiple devices. So it's very important, you know, these things are real. This level of optimization is easy to get, uh, easy to implement, but the benefits that it brings are incredible. And then we go towards the you know more sophisticated forms of uh, of optimization. For example, operator fusion that uh, eliminates intermediate allocations uh, because when you fuse two operators together, there are all intermediate allocations and and so less memory pressure um, that you have as immediate immediate uh, consequence of that fusion. A compiler can also take care of uh, dead code elimination. This is a very important one. So what is dead code? That code is code without any side effect. So it should not be there. <laughs> so you say, why it is there? Well, it is there because probably after some graph optimizations, 
some dead code has been generated automatically by uh, graph optimization uh, routines. So usually it's not the developer that creates that code um, that needs to be eliminated unless the developer does that explicitly for no reason, apparently, um, or forgets about that code. But otherwise, the compiler can eliminate the dead code uh, that is generated by other form of optimizations or other stages of optimization. Um, there is also static memory planning. Static memory planning is usually done offline and uh, it essentially allows you to reuse memory buffers as much as possible. Um, you know, you don't want to, first of all, you don't want to leak memory and you want to use it in the most efficient way. Memory is a very precious resource in, uh, for computers, regardless of how much memory do you have. If an algorithm is as a recursive function, even gigabytes and gigabytes of memory would not be sufficient to support that particular algorithm that probably has been badly written and not optimized. So don't come with the idea that, huh, I don't care, I have a lot of memory because, you know, today memory is cheap with respect to 10 years ago. I actually had that many times. Even colleagues who said, yeah, this algorithm is fine. I mean, yeah, it's a bit expensive, but, eh, you know, there is memory. No, there's never enough memory. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm a bit sensitive about this topic, but static memory planning allows you to optimize memory usage statically, which means offline. That's also a very important optimization that uh, deep learning compilers can already do. And finally, layout transformation. So layout transformation is a form of optimization that um, allows you to find the best data layout to store tensors, matrices, and multidimensional vectors in the computation graph, okay? So you don't want, you know, you want these things to be dense and to be optimized in, you know, in space. So there is a space optimization that you need to provide. And that's where layout transformation helps you identifying, you know, kind of in a Tetris game to fill the, uh, you know, the plane as much as you can and have no holes in your plane, remember? the Tetris game, 80s. Anyway, shall we move to backend optimization? So these are all, these were all the things that you can do, all the op forms of optimizations that you can apply at the front end level. Of course, they are not all of them. You can do much more than what I'm saying here. This podcast is not, to be, is not supposed to be exhaustive list of uh, all possible optimizations. There is optimization theory and compiler uh, methodologies and techniques that are books and books and years and years and years of uh, uh, practicing and uh, improving these skills. So don't expect to have this, all this knowledge in 20 minute episode. I wish <laughs> or you wish. Um, backhand optimizations. Well, here we are on the hardware, right? So when I say backhand, when you hear backhand in this context, you are facing with the hardware. So it means that you have um, at least some information about the hardware that you are generating code for. Um, now, the type of optimization that you want to perform at this point is hardware specific optimization. And so uh, this is a type of optimization that indeed is considering uh, how many registers do you have? What's the length of your, what's the size of the registers? If you have CPU, GPU cores, how many of them do you have? Uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, hardware specific information that is taken into account at this stage. Uh, then we have uh, memory allocation. So memory allocation is probably the most used operation or the most performed operation when you run a deep learning uh, model or pretty much any uh, code in uh, on, on on bare metal right? so if you can ideally uh, store everything into registers <laughs> you are saving uh, you're sparing yourself from loading and storing to memory so the memory bus is always going to be free you are in a in the best case scenario, of course, but uh, you know that registers are not that large. Uh, and of course, at some point you have to use the memory that you purchased and, uh, and save stuff there. So memory allocation is indeed something that uh, can be optimized and usually is optimized in uh, a backend optimization strategy. Uh, this is where, for example, you 
take into account of uh, uh, take into account the data locality you usually tend to uh, optimize towards data locality so uh, also optimizing towards the presence of caches if your architecture has a cache or multiple caches um, and so these are the optimizations that are performed by deep learning compilers on the back end in the low level space uh, loop oriented optimizations these are probably one of the most interesting ones and uh, diverse we have loop fusion tiling loop reordering loop unrolling there was another one i think oh sliding window uh, it's another one um, so these come all these are all techniques that are used in uh, uh, compiler and interpreter optimization uh, for example loop fusion is uh, a loop optimization technique that allows you to uh, fuse two or more loops with the, with the same boundaries um, so you can have better data reuse tiling is uh, is another one uh, it allows you to split loops into several tiles and uh, and so loops are divided into uh, outer loops uh, iterating through tiles and inner loops iterating inside a tile uh, and this transformation um, allows you to exploit or take advantage of data locality so that you can better exploit hardware caches um, another one is loop unrolling it allows you to unroll a specific loop to a fixed number of copies of uh, loop bodies and this allows the compiler to uh, apply instruction level parallelism much more aggressively than they can do when you have for example nested loop uh, not unrolled imagine you have 4i 4j 4k please don't do that unless extremely necessary that's a no n cube right complexity so there are cases in which uh, you can lower the complexity the time complexity and compute complexity by unrolling the inner loops uh, into a number of fixed um, number of copies in the, part of the backend optimization uh, is the auto tuning it's something that really belongs to uh, several deep learning compilers out there in particular apache tvm is probably one of the best in my opinion um, and this allows you to um, you know the auto tuning of course as the name says it allows the compiler to uh, explore the uh, uh, parameter space of all possible you know taking into account a graph intermediate representation as well as hardware and low level intermediate representation and hardware information to find and determine the optimal parameter configurations that better suit the particular hardware and the particular model on the particular hardware of course when we speak about auto tuning and if you play a bit with apache tvm you will have the chance of uh, playing with exact with this very concept you will let apache tvm run <laughs> for a long time depending on the uh, of the size on the size of your model but what what auto tvm will do is essentially running the model on the real uh, target architecture collecting some metrics and generating data you know uh, training data for a machine learning model that uh, starts tuning the parameters according to those metrics and so uh, the idea behind auto tune uh, auto tuning and in particular auto tuning for uh, for tvm for apache tvm is I understand that the parameter space can be extremely large and this means that you know finding all possible parameters exhaustively is going to take me ages sometimes it's not going to be possible in in you know in feasible time so how about predicting complexity and so predicting the time for example that a particular graph or subgraph will take on that particular architecture instead of actually running it and uh, and measuring right so that's what auto tvm, uh, auto -TVM does uh, auto tuning for tvm does i keep saying auto tvm i don't think it exists but anyway of course when we speak about auto tuning we also speak about a cost model um, after all this is a machine learning um, model that helps you optimizing another machine learning model <laughs> so you have a cost model and the cost model can be of different uh, in different flavors for example it can be a machine learning based cost model it can be a predefined cost model when you have engineers that have been designing it for you and kind of uh, you know putting in the in the tool chain directly and we can have black box models um, that usually are less optimized i think that the best uh, 
shot that you have here is uh, having a machine learning based cost model, which is exactly what TVM and probably XLA, if I'm not wrong, um, they both do that. But auto, uh, TVM in particular does exactly that. Uh, then we need searching techniques. So uh, what's the next, uh, you know, once you define the cost model, of course, how do you explore your dimensional space, right? So you need a searching technique. And here you can have different flavors as well. You can have, uh, for example, simulated and healing algorithms. You can use reinforcement learning. You can use genetic algorithm for global optimization strategies. So, you know, all the things that we have seen happening in uh, you know traditional machine learning are in fact applicable here uh, because in fact that's what we are talking about we are talking about an optimization and a searching uh, strategy of the next but good potential candidate for our uh, for our architecture right and tvm again i think is king here um, because apache tvm supports uh, cross compilation and uh, rpc that allow user, a user to compile on the local machine, run the programs with different auto-tuning configurations on multiple targets, and then collect all these results and optimize. And so applying a, um, um, a cost model and a searching technique, in particular, a machine learning based cost model. And um, um, I think it's a simulated annealing algorithm as an auto-tuning technique used by TVM and improve that and you know run this over and over again until no further improvement is possible or is measured and you will have essentially a, a representation of your initial model uh, that is pretty much optimized for that particular um, target architecture so that particular hardware now as you can understand the level of complexity here is growing and growing and growing you know if you you know already optimizing at the high level so at the framework level is something imagine now adding to the uh, to the list also an optimization that takes into account the hardware add even more complexity when you consider everything in between when you consider for example the high level intermediate representation and the low level intermediate representation and everything in between so you know the complexity of uh, the typical workflow that goes from let's say your pytorch or your tensorflow model to the instruction set architecture, to, to the instructions that are specific to the uh, hardware that you are compiling for, it's an incredible amount of steps and incredible uh, complexity uh, that you are dealing with here. And so that's why I think that automated, uh, automated tools are uh, king in the, this scenario. Don't expect to do everything manually you know the this is not uh, human approachable in my opinion also because the hardwares the, the the hardware vendors keep producing hardware and keep producing different chips so you cannot expect that uh, engineers are there uh, working day and night to optimize these things as they get created so it's not feasible it's not sustainable and it's not the best shot that you have so Automated tools, in my opinion, are the best shot that one has to dealing with uh, uh, models that keep changing. You know, as a data scientist, I'm, I should be free of, of developing whatever I, uh, I want and I believe is working to solve that business problem. But also as a hardware vendor, I don't want to have the limitation of saying, okay, my model can run only on this CPU with this particular instruction set architecture and so on and so forth. I want to have that freedom of saying, of experimenting with different vendors, different hardware architecture, and different machine learning models. That's where tools like TVM, uh, TC, which stands for uh, Tensor Comprehensive or Comprehension, I'm not really sure. It's uh, another deep learning framework, uh, deep learning compiler developed by Facebook. Uh, then we have PyTorch Glow, XLA, also provided by Google, uh, and Graph provided by Intel. Um, and did I mention Apache TVM? Mm, yes, of course, that was the first one. Uh, that's my favorite. I don't know if you guys understood my preference. There have been, well, not so many benchmarks out there, but from a um, rough comparison uh, among these uh, five big players in uh, the deep learning compiler uh, ecosystem, I am pretty sure to say that uh, Apache TVM is uh, the winner here. Uh, 
the models that get uh, compiled and optimized are usually faster than the others. And also the uh, amount or the, the, the diversity of the hardware that Apache TVM can support is incredible. Um, and for this, we have to thank the community, the open source community for uh, making and building such a great tool um, and, and releasing it for the public. Though using this tool is not a piece of cake, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm alerting you. It's, it takes some time to get familiar with all the components. As you can understand, this is complex stuff. And uh, don't expect that uh, you will master Apache TVM overnight. Probably you will run a, a bunch of tutorials and uh, things will work as, uh, as, you know, as it's written in the tutorial. But when you start tweaking and tuning stuff and you slightly change your architecture or consider, let's say, less common uh, hardware architectures and vendors, things start getting nasty there. OK, so don't expect these things to uh, to be smooth as as PyTorch now or the TensorFlow uh, library usually are. What is missing for of these tools? I think that, um, well, a lot of stuff is missing, of course, but um, this is already great. I'm not complaining. Um, but of course, you know, to complete the picture, I think that the very first thing that should be implemented is uh, considering new optimization targets, not necessarily related to hardware capabilities, but also memory footprint, energy consumption. These are two metrics that are, uh, they, you know, people keep ignoring, and I think they are essential. Uh, they, they should be considered from now on. Uh, so as I mentioned in another episode uh, about green AI, a model is optimized because of accuracy, and that's fine, that's great, because you know it performs predictions that are accurate and reliable, but a model could also be or should also be optimized towards um, um, energy consumption. Um, is that model green? Uh, you know, uh, memory footprint is another important. Memory footprint is usually very much correlated with uh, uh, energy consumption, uh, though the two things are you know can be um, pretty um, different, but. Usually they are correlated because, of course, bigger memory footprint means, uh, you know, more energy consumed to maintain that footprint. But anyway, these are two metrics that uh, go are kind of in contrast with respect to, for example, accuracy and, of course, speed. There are several models and several sectors and domains where uh, we probably don't need real time, uh, but we need uh, green AI and we need uh, AI that doesn't consume a lot of energy and we need... Uh, AI that, in the case of MCU, for example, and embedded devices, that doesn't have a, um, that has a decent and an acceptable and ac acceptable memory footprint. Otherwise, you know, many times these models are not even uh, feasible to, to be uh, performed on tiny hardware. I guess that's it. Uh, this was a nice journey for me. It's always challenging to explain uh, concepts of this caliber. These concepts are probably easier to read and uh, to play with rather than you know speaking <laughs> on a podcast for sure at least that's the type of challenge that i personally found uh, during this series of embedded machine learning i'm a uh, very very excited about this this topic uh, and this is in fact our biggest bet at amethyx technologies the company that i founded uh, a few years ago uh, amethyx.com a m e t h i x.com and of course we uh, also do embedded machine learning as uh, uh, one of the most important branches now providing optimization strategies and uh, of course model optimization for different sectors on different devices um, usually in the family of ARM Cortex M. And so if you uh, need help there, uh, don't hesitate to contact me via the usual channels, uh, the podcast channel, the Discord channel, uh, even amethyx.com. There is a contact form. We are always happy to help. I really, really hope that uh, you found this series or you find, will find this series um, interesting and uh, and useful for uh, for your problems, for your issues, for your challenges, and for your career. Why not? Thank you so much for listening. I talk to you next time.
You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new, fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.